Hello. Hey, Hi, I'm, at, I'm at the event still. Oh, great. But uh, I'll give you a brief tour. Oh, OK. There we go. I'm going to show you around. Here's a, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, Wi-Fi is kind of bad, but I'll come back inside. This is sort of the Fort yeah. William Henry. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Fort William Henry. That's where they have it. They're really nice, though. It's in Lake George, New York. Yeah. <laughs> Just finishing up like the morning keynote. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just going to take a minute and talk about what the rest of the day is. So, yeah. Just a, a brief tour. Yeah. So, you can going to go on the poster presentation next. Okay. Is, is like the audio, like the video quality okay? So I know I'm moving. Oh, yeah, it was so. pretty good. Yeah, it was like I could see the. All right. Is that? There we go. Could you say that again? Sorry. Oh, it was pretty good. Yeah, it didn't lag at all, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually louder in here because they have like the features. I'm going to get out of here so we can talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's the most oh, session. Yeah. Here we go. There we go. All right, great. I'll stay here for like a couple minutes. But yeah, um, I have like a couple of minutes, but it's been really good. It's been great. How are you? Hi, Bradley. Uh, pretty good. I'm doing all right. Uh, we got uh, that paper published yesterday i saw some is it were there two papers or one because i saw different alerts at, uh, but it's, it's good there was the paper and then there was a special issue so the special oh. issue had like okay. uh every like adam saffron was in there and uh mike levin was in there and you know we had uh we were in there you know we have uh, i have the uh i have you know i've been kind of going through it I'm going to try to make some promotional materials for it, or I'd like to make some promotional materials for it. So that's something that what we'll to work on. Um, and so that's, but that's out now. That's great. I, 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 I have, this week has been so uh, full of a lot of things. And I look forward to like just returning to normal. It's even coming here. It's like four hours to come here. And I, I wasn't, we got to the hotel and there wasn't a whole lot of stuff. Like, we didn't know if we needed room, more room. So I actually stayed with my family, which is good, but it's a lot of driving. So I look forward to being back in a more stable state where I can look at everything and enjoy what's happening. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been a time where it's like, just, I don't, I have like all these different emotions to process. I just, Accepted to a program, which is great. Oh, well, yeah, congratulations. Um, uh, the traveling, the conference was, yeah, thank you. The conference was really, um, really good. I'm, I'm really disappointed. I was in this old project, there's old projector, and just the guy was sure, like, oh, you're really out of luck. You're not even going to be able to play it because there's no speaker. It's like, there's a speaker there, but in the, in the projector, because I knew it was a really old, one, but it didn't look like it, but it just, it was so, uh, it, it was, the actual presentation went well. There were a few, like I had to trim some stuff because we just ended up having a little bit, I, I kind of had to skip around, including my own presentation, but it went well. Um, people were happy. There were a lot of questions. The room was full and it stayed full. I showed like the video in Slack, but just like everybody in there, like a second long video, but it was really good. Nobody's, um, uh, well, we'll the conference has been a little bit off kilter in terms of its slack use. So I think I'm going to oh, get more questions later. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's good. And uh, I'm going to try to take some pictures. Oh, hey, Amanda. I'm going to try to take some pictures like. Uh, I'm going to attempt to use my laptop as a simulated group photo. So I'll try <laughs> to do like the end screen with everybody in it. Uh, there's like a there's like a chair we'll be sitting in that kind of is about supporting women's diversity 
So hopefully that'll happen a little bit later today. But yeah, it's been good. It's been really nice. I'm happy to be here. Um, but I'm also glad that it's kind of past the crest now and I can relax a bit more and get back to writing and doing stuff I want to do. Like, I really want to push out Frontier Maps. I really want to, Amanda's here, but like, I don't know if I have to go in like a couple minutes. Um, yeah. But Cognition Futures is super exciting right now, like super duper duper exciting uh, because all like the pieces are starting to actually crystallize and we can make the puzzle now that the pieces are a little more set. Um, and it's, you know, still early stages of that, but I just look forward to having more time um, to do that. Hey, man, did you want to give an update or anything? If not, that's fine. Um, okay. So having Wi-Fi issues. Main update is the first Hugo Habe, which is the uh, human use, human use of... Group. Yeah, uh, human use of human beings or whatever. RG meeting will be Thursday, the twenty seventh at seven p.m. EDT. So that's in the evening on Thursday instead of wet. Like we usually meet our do our cognition features meeting on Wednesday. This would be on Thursday and an hour and a half earlier. And then also, yes, cognition futures work has been moving forward, and I'm excited for our next meeting. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I, if I have time, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I think I might make a generic submission to the FQXI one okay. too. Yeah. I don't know if, like, if I get it out and people want to review it or like add on to it, you can. But I know it's, it's basically, if I can do it in the next two days. Then it'll be something. I think it's to the 19th, which is four days away, but it's basically they're going to happen today, Monday, today through Monday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and one version of reality that that's what I do with kind of my weekend, or yeah. like it, it's, it's a very good situation because for me, obviously, I, I kind of have my own agenda, and people who have been in the lab kind of know some of my agenda, but. It'd be a good part of my agenda is actually, I guess, related to the the, the topic. Like, how do we do science? Like, we're like, what what do we, how do we do it? Like, at a different level. I've seen some of the. I, I got really nervous because I caught, I saw I looked at the website again and saw someone like oh like had like a very similar sounding idea to me. Oh. <laughs> I looked th at their paper because I'm like oh, but um, it actually you know, my idea is pretty different, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's kind of weird that you can see them before you submit them. I almost feel like that's a bias or advantage that people who submit later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> like that. It, it, in this case, I'm not. I'm not particularly affected. But I also feel like, what if you just like scoop someone's idea, or like the one the most likes, and then right. <laughs> oh, I have this, and then this too. So I'm like that much, you know, more. Interesting. So I don't know. It's, it doesn't really matter, but yeah, it's. I mean, they may find that gaming the system is easier than they thought. Um. Any questions? Anything you want to ask about? Like Nick Quickwell is still in the fresh of my mind. I guess. Yeah. I mean, like going over the session. I mean, how was the? How did the session? How was it received? And really good. Um. It, it wasn't perfectly executed because I'm just, to be frank, and I love Nickwick, but like the technical availability of the, the venue is a little limited. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the old, it's the old fort. Yeah. yeah. The 1700s. Yeah. So, um, but that said, like, it was it was well received. Um, I look like Gary. I feel like I look like Gary Marcus from his class. Yeah, design. kind of. <laughs> oh my god! Like I can't escape it. Like oh my god! I look like I'm pretending to be Gary Marcus. Like <laughs> uh, more robust AI. Um, 
and take my glasses off just because of that reason, right? Now, just for my own vanity. <laughs> oh. um, it went well. Uh, outside of the technical stuff, it went well. We did. I didn't. I don't think. I, I don't think I even showed you the finished products. And I'm sorry. Um, I I might have put them uh, on on the playlist or I uploaded them to YouTube, but I don't think I shared them to you. Um, basically, it was your talk. Which we had to abbreviate a little bit. Uh, Valeria, I don't know if I haven't mentioned, like, we were, we, we were on the fence with Valeria so much. And she's like, hey, I'll just like say stuff. So we took her. Um, it actually was a wonderful way to do a flash talk because we just, it was like she just, we had a conversation, a little bit of a primer. And she's like, okay, I'm going to say this. It just recorded like her voice messages. And I, we, I, I basically, with her, I made the slides to fit what she said, like retrospectively. Yeah. Well, it was really great. It was super easy. It was very simple. It was like three slides, three or four slides. Um, but it was a nice primer to uh, some issues in law and data privacy, data rights, and, and how that's potentially a gendered issue. It was like five minutes. I, I had things on like one and a half speed, so it was a little bit fast. But it was good. Like it was, it was, people appreciated it, even if it was a little bit scary. Like it was not a fun topic. Like, it was like but it was good. We did Ankit's work, uh, which is really good. Um, had to abridge it a little bit because the intro, we had 30 minutes and it was supposed to be 20 minutes. Right. And I did it for like 25 minutes. The intro took like five minutes. So we were like, we had to make up five minutes anyway. It was tough. Um, and then Jen and I did a little bit on the open source, open, like big federal, federal mandates on data and some DEI related stuff. And we pitched the DEI paper for We Robot and some stuff like that. So it went really well. I think I'm gonna have to go because the poster session is starting and it's right. gonna go. Um, yeah, well received, great questions at the end, questions about, um, I referred to, I mentioned a little bit like Tina Jabru and then versus OpenAI uh, and uh, Statistic Paris Day and things like that. So um, someone asked about artists, someone asked about how hard it is to train the models? Like, how do you get how do you get a clean data set? And how long does it take to get to clip to get an unbiased or a really good data set? Right. And someone asked about like your inspiration. So I did a little pitch at the start of it, saying, "Hey, we made Society Ethics Technology Team to be a place where people in tech and outside of tech could come to relate and get to experience and talk to each other." And that someone asked basically about that, and it was like a nice exchange we had about like why do you do that? It's kind of about creating agency and opportunity to know you have a place in the a seat at the table to have the conversations so right it's getting louder here and post session starting so i'm probably going to go but right. um i'll check in later if i can so all right thanks yeah talk to you later good luck bye so that was jesse uh, live from nickwick at fort william henry in new york and uh they had the session yesterday uh we weren't able to do a, a, last year we did a hybrid session we had people on Jitsi and we had people live in the uh, at the conference and we were able to ask questions and present. This year we couldn't do that. We just had to do like an abbreviated session, but we had the recordings in advance. So Jesse was able to pull it off and, and congratulations again to Jesse for that great task. Um, and we're going to be putting the uh, talks in their entirety on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to check those out. Uh, it looks like Vrishali was here. I don't know if she had to drop out, she had bandwidth issues or what, but hopefully she can come back. And Amanda's here as well. So uh, actually I had some, a couple things on I'll share my screen. A couple things on Nickwick that we had uh, I put together before the meeting. So yeah, the Jesse, we we've had some discussion in the Slack about things. Uh, so Jesse took this little video of the session, and that was the attendance. So it was pretty. This looks like it was standing room only. So that's great. Uh, then we had uh, we had. Uh, 
Samantha Carroyo, who is a, a person, an intern in the lab last year, and she was at she met Jesse in person. So I wasn't able to make it because I don't live close enough. But uh, she was able to make it, and she met uh, with Jesse. And so congratulations to Samantha. Um, and this is there she is signed up. Uh, it's the AI ethics panel. And like I mentioned, we will be putting together a playlist. We have a couple videos. This was from last year. This was the hybrid session up here. And then we have these here. Uh, this is mine, Impact of New Technologies on Open Source Projects. And then Aiden, Aiden Tripodi and Ankit Grover, Ethical Implications of program, uh, Programmably Generated Content. So this is on generative models and AI. And as Jesse said, there are a couple others I need to put on here, but we'll have those in due time. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so, I don't know if there are any questions about that. Okay. So, that's that's another successful event um, for the for the year. We'll be we do this every year, so. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do more, uh, maybe follow up on some of the rich vein of stuff with generative models and AI, uh, and then the open source implications of it. So this is something that's kind of uh, evolving in real time, so it's hard to know where it will end up, where we'll be next year. But um, suffice it to say there are a lot of issues that are very relevant to the current world of tech and AI so uh, and again you know this is something that we'd like to follow up on if you watch if you were at the conference or watch one of our videos on YouTube on the topic and you're interested in knowing more or contributing more to that topic please uh, let us know join our slack uh, we have our website orthogonal research weebly.com and we have links to the Slack, and we have links to the Discord channels for different topics. So please join in the discussion there. You'll want to drop in the Slack channel for the AI ethics stuff. But we have other uh, Discord channels for virtual reality and uh, education and uh, critical periods, which we haven't talked much about recently, but it's there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that all is very exciting. Um, I'm hoping that this reading group, going back to this book from 1950, I'm hoping that there will be opportunities to like make make connections between what Biner's talking about and like particular you know, issues um, with technology today. So I'm hoping there can be some kind of connection to the Society Ethics Tech group that comes from the reading group. Yeah, I think that's always always good that we have these connections, these cross connections. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not really familiar with the book, so I've not read it in advance, so I don't know what the uh, arguments are, but it looks like it'll be fun. Yeah, I know the general theme, and I read the preface, and so it's it seems like um, it'll be very relevant. Good. That's great. All right. So that's uh, now I want to move shift gears to a new paper that just came out this week. So Jesse, of course, myself, and uh, Richard Gordon, who is a frequent uh, contributor to the Diva Worm group, we all wrote a paper on um, a topic that. So, what we do in the Diva Worm group is we do a lot of things. We do developmental biology, we also do uh, uh, biological physics. We do things on early life. We do other types of uh, topical, you know, uh, deep dives, and we've written papers on a number of topics. And so this paper is the result of some of the work that we've done on a uh, number of topics in the uh, like in development and, and developmental biology and the embryo and agents and things like that. And it, we 
wrote this in response to a special issue that uh, Adam Saffron and Michael Levin uh, and a couple other people uh, developed the idea for, and they were soliciting contributors, and we responded and put together a paper. Hello, Vershali, how are you? Glad to see you were able to make it back in. Um, so, would you like to, oh, Vershali, would you like to give an update? Uh, you can put it in the chat if you want. Uh, I'm just going to talk about something here for a minute. Uh, yeah. So we did this topic, the topic of the special issue. Let me just share my screen to kind of get to the meat of this. So this was in Royal Society Interface Focus. This is a journal of... Uh, you know, the Royal Society puts out a number of journals. This is a journal that focuses on different types of reviews and current issues. So the title of the special issue is Making and Breaking Symmetries in Mind and Life. So what I think they were trying to do here is they were trying to, like, get a, uh, their hands around this idea of symmetries and how they're made or break, broken in development or in embodiment or in the mind and so it was kind of an interesting mix of of topics uh that made the cut uh so it, i think this was uh this special issue had a previous life for another journal and then they pulled it from that journal and put it here so the i remember distinctly that the papers that i saw in that special issue were different than what we ended up with here but Anyways, this is out. Um, so this starts with this paper, Making and Breaking Symmetries in Mind and Life. Uh, this is the, the sort of, I will get to the intro paper here in a minute. But if we go through some of these, uh, Maxwell Ramstead, Carl Friston, Brennan Klein, these are people from the Active Inference Lab, uh, Connor Hines. They did a paper on Bayesian mechanics of physics of and by beliefs. So that's uh, interesting, uh, some of the work that they've been doing. Uh, and wow. I imagine it involves the free energy principle and some of these other things. Uh, this one by Stuart Kaufman uh, and colleague. Uh, mixed uh, anhydrides at the intersection between peptide and RNA autocatalytic sets. Evolution of biological coding. So this is uh, where, you know, they're doing these uh, RNA hypercycles, which are hypothesized to be sort of the origins of life. So that's kind of an interesting article. Then uh, Chang Sub Kim, Free Energy and Inference in Living Systems. So more uh, free energy principle and active inference. Stuart Kaufman again with Andrea Rowley, a third transition in science. Uh, that's almost like kind of one of these uh, sort of philosophy of science papers that we've talked about with respect to uh, like the philosophy of science and, and how science is done and how things change in science. Uh, then here's our paper, Embodied Cognitive Morphogenesis is a Route to Intelligent Systems. We'll kind of look at that in a minute, the final version of that. Um, then uh, Mike Levin and Leo Pio Lopez uh, Joanna Bischoff and Jennifer LaPalm. The scaling of goals from cellular to anatomical homeostasis and evolutionary simulation experiment and analysis. And that, that's been out as a preprint for some time. So I actually had it in my reading queue, not thinking, not remembering or not seeing that it was in the special issue. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, chiral conformity emerges from the least time free energy consumption. So this is I guess more another free energy principle paper. Symmetry, simplicity, broken symmetry, complexity. This is David Krakauer, who is at the Santa Fe Institute. So this is a big name paper. Um, and so that's, again, this is going back to symmetry and this topic of breaking symmetry uh, and complexity. Uh, Adam Saffron and colleagues here, as without, so within how the brain's temporal or spatial alignment to the environment shapes consciousness. So this is, uh, it looks like it's almost like an embodiment paper where they're looking at 
sort of the alignment of the brain with the environment. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know these authors, but symmetry and complexity and object-centric deep active inference models and more active inference neuromodular uh, neuromodulatory control of complex adaptive systems in the brain, Jing Shine. Uh, reflections on the asymmetry of causation. The lack of temporal brain dynamics is asymmetry is a signature of impaired consciousness states. So we're getting into consciousness and some of these things. And then emergence of common concepts, symmetries, and conformity in agent groups and information theoretic model. So this is Daniel Polani and Marco Moeller. Uh, so these are a lot of good papers in here. I, I don't know, I'll be spending a lot of time on that, probably going through some of it. Uh, well, but we're in this special issue, so we're in this good company. And uh, let's see. I have a couple things here. First of all, a comment on the, the cover image. So every special issue of a journal has a cover image, ideally. And these would take it maybe from the papers, uh, one of the papers, one of the figures, or they make it up like some artist draws up a figure for the special issue. This is uh, what Mike Levin did was he prompted this from MidJourney, which is a generative AI program. So this is uh, <laughs> this image made in the style of the classic Codex Serifanius shows how the AI program MidJourney visualizes the concept of multi-scale goals. And as described by the title of this paper, the scaling of goals from cellular anatomical homeostasis. So this was based on Mike Levin and company's paper, and they just he prompted this image from this this topic. Uh, so this yeah this is produced by Mid Journey in response to a prompt by Michael Levin. So that's uh, that's a nice nice way to do that. Oh hello Morgan. Uh, let's check the chat here. So, uh, okay, uh, Amanda says, I downloaded the paper, The Scaling of Goals, goals from Cellular to Anatomical Homeostasis, and I'd love to dig into it. Yeah, it'd be good. actually, we're going to talk about it in a minute here. So we'll kind of look at it, but you, yeah, to dig into it, you have to go through and yeah. The Northoff paper also looks awesome. Yeah. So some of these papers are open and some are not. Ours is not open. Yeah, through the journal portal, but we have a preprint on the Sci Archive. So I think a lot of these are like what they call green open access, where the authors just deposit a version of it on a preprint server. So if you sometimes if you search the title, you can get that preprint, and that's that's also a way to do it because access on some journals, you know, our our my home library, for example, didn't have the first six months of this journal. Uh, I was able to get it through like an author link, but I, yeah, it's not great sometimes getting access to these papers, but in any case, um, let's go back to the, the papers. So the intro paper is this making and breaking of symmetries in mind and life. And so this is usually the way they do it in a special issue. They give like a kind of an intro to the theme, and then they give the papers, so they kind of tell how these papers fit together. Uh, so we have uh, Adam Saffron, of course, as we know, uh, Dalton uh, uh, Vadavel, uh, Zahra uh, Sheikh Baha'i, uh, Baha Magnus Bain, uh, Adil Razi, and Michael Love. So these are people who work in sort of that intersection of computer science and the brain and uh, some biology, although it's mostly computer science and the brain. So uh, so the abstract reads, symmetry is a motif featuring in almost all areas of science. Symmetries appear throughout the natural world, making them particularly important in our quest to understand the structure of the world around us. Symmetries and invariances are often the first principles pointing to some lawful description of an observation with explanations being understood as both satisfying and potentially useful in the regularity. So what they mean is that you have symmetries, which are these uh, where you have some sort of uh, like uh, pair pairings uh, between say hemispheres or between parts. Usually you have a midline or some sort of axis and things are replicated along that axis. 
And so you can detect symmetries in mathematics. You can also detect them in biology. You can detect them in the brain and so forth. And then invariances are things that are not variable. So if you have things like structures that always appear, uh, sometimes in network theory, we have things like simplices and triangles. And so, you know, triangles are motifs that are, you know, it's a triangle of three nodes connected uh, together. Uh, simplices are just basically shapes that, higher order shapes that form in the structure, like maybe like a pyramid that forms in the structure of a network. So you have these kinds of things that are invariant. Sometimes they appear in certain places always. And so invariants are probably things that don't vary too much. And so they're arguing that these symmetries and invariances can be used as first principles to describe, use, used to describe scientific laws. So, you know, we have a lot of, uh, so, you know, some people argue that there aren't such things as physical laws. Well, they, they're physical laws, but that the physical laws can't be applied to other areas like the brain or like development. And so, um, you know, that's a debatable thing. When we talk about power laws, that's what we mean by a first principle informing our system. So we can analyze our system using a power law. We can describe certain aspects of it. Uh, network theory is also something that can be described uh, as a first principle because you have connectivity, you have certain patterns of connectivity and that vary, that's invariant across different systems. And so, you know, we can use the, those sorts of things to make those kind of statements and predictions. Um, and then they go on, the sense of aesthetic beauty accompanying such explanations as reminiscent is reminiscent of our understanding of intelligence in terms of the ability to efficiently comp predict or compress data. So indeed, identifying and building on symmetry can often be a particularly elegant description of a physical situation. So if you combine symmetries, you can actually describe uh, physical systems quite well. Uh, so this, you know, this builds on what we know from mathematics. In mathematics, there's a whole field of symmetry and a lot of times mathematics is based on the balancing of equations. And so we actually have, uh, you know, theories, higher order theories, like uh, things like string theory and gauge theory, where they have these, they rely on symmetries uh, to describe physical uh, systems. The study of symmetries is so fundamental to mathematics and physics that one might ask where else it proves useful. This theme issue poses the question. What does the study of symmetry, symmetry breaking in particular, have to offer for the study of life and mind? So uh, they kind of go through uh, the collection here. Okay, they talk about gauge theory here. Uh, whenever a physical theory has a redundant quantity, meaning a quantity that leaves the system's dynamics invariant with respect to local changes in the value of that quantity, what they call a frame of reference or a gauge, we can understand that quantity as a kind of abstract symmetry recorded in what is called a gauge field. And so in gauge theory and physics, they use this framework. And so this is just one example of a symmetry. Uh, deformation of gauge fields are understood as fictitious forces. Uh, in other words, these forces restore the local symmetry of quantities that are dynamically invariant by recording the system's interactions of the field of possible gauges for that quantity. And so gauge theories provide a general way of modeling physical systems. Uh, use cases include general relativities, relativity's handling of gravity as the curvature of space-time and models of the attractive and repulsive forces in electromagnetic fields. So you can actually, you know, use these for a number of systems uh, and it, you know, it generalizes pretty well. Uh, then they get into like free energy principle and active inference. That's why we have so many of these active inference papers in here. Um, the gauge theory is very important to this in terms of understanding some of the way that the free energy principle and active inference uh, active inference is AI, by the way, so uh, they don't mean artificial intelligence. Uh, so there's actually four papers on free energy. Uh, the attracting states of nervous systems are understood as entailing predictions 
where the consistent realization of these predictions can be viewed as the preservation of goal states contingent on particular symmetries being enforced by a gauge field governing these dynamics. So this is, again, like kind of getting into some of these issues. Uh, this is pretty, you know, dense uh, stuff. So uh, let's see. Can I... So they talk about the papers, uh, free energy principle and active inference. And then I'm trying to see if they mention kind of our area, which is here, morphogenesis and self-organization. So I hear there have been a couple of comments in the chat here. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'll get to Vershali's update in a minute. Um, on asymmetry in neural dynamics of consciousness. So that's a paper that Amanda found on thinking about consciousness and symmetries and asymmetries. So yeah, I'll get back to your uh, update in a minute, Vershali. I just want to hit this last point here. Um, so yeah, our paper focuses on morphogenesis and self-organization. Based on the relations to predictive coding, we believe these same principles apply. Uh, perhaps we may even think of pre-theoretic in intuitions relating to the nature of living phenomena, where the no notion of a life force may receive some limited support from abstract formalisms. Notably, the reliable creation and regeneration of particular forms over the course of development has been described in terms of morphogenetic fields. And this is something that is a sort of a controversial concept in uh, developmental biology, but it, it has to do with sort of how does the embryo know how to build a phenotype? Do you have fields that are controlled by uh, something like an electromagnetic potential? Or, you know, how do these, how do the cells behave collectively to form uh, these things? I hear someone's wanting to speak. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Right. So the idea of gauge theoretic forces could be understood as governing not just ontogeny, but also phylogeny as free energy minimizing processes. So they mean that uh, this could be both developmental and evolutionary, which is what phylogeny is. Uh, is an attractive one, especially where development itself is understood as a particular kind of evolution, or I guess a peculiar kind of evolution. Uh, yeah, so then it kind of talks about some of the functional properties of biological systems, how is mo molecular chirality or asymmetry with respect to direction amplified into body-wide asymmetry with respect to organ position relative to the midline, which is, of course, this idea of symmetry. Um, and kind of goes through, yeah. So, oh, this is the summary of contribution. So that was the introduction. And then this is their summary here where they talk about, um, so this, this David Krakauer paper, Symmetry, Simplicity, Broken, Symmetry, Complexity, provides a beautiful introduction to many of the core themes of this collection. He describes how complex phenomena are made possible when physical symmetries are broken and selected ground states perform mechanical work and store adaptive information. And this builds on this article from the 1970s by Philip Anderson, More is Different. Krakauer describes how emergence, frustrated random functions, autonomy, and generalized rigidity characterize the nature of complexity. So this More is Different is actually an important paper if you're interested in emergence versus um, uh, reductionism. So this is uh, definitely an interesting, I think for uh, even our cognition futures group might be an interesting paper to think about a little bit. Um, let's see if I can find ours. Uh, just kind of going through this. Uh, Uh, yeah. They talk about the scaling of goals via homeostasis and evolutionary simulation, experiment and, an experiment and analysis, uh, demonstrates how fluctuating stress levels, stochastic resonance and low rattling, which is a measurement that they use in complex systems, the rattling number, 
or a little rattling, uh, may allow for surprising levels of intelligence from coordinating, sub coordinating subagents. And this is in the context of a morphogenetic process. So they talk about the TAME framework, which is what Michael Levin has developed to talk about different levels of cognitive competencies. And they talk about homeostasis. Okay, so embodied in embodied cognitive morphogenesis as a route to intelligent systems, uh, myself et al. provide a powerfully compelling account of the ways in which morphogenetic uh, symmetry breaking produces specialized organismal subsystems and how this serves as a substrate for the emergence of autonomous behaviors with properties related to acquisition, generativity, and transformation. They describe this embodied cognitive morphogenesis as providing a means of bridging an embryological view, emphasizing coordinated gene expression, cellular physics, and migration, with a more inactivist perspective, centering on informational feedback between the organisms and their environment, which is key to the emergence of intelligent behaviors. They further outline their work with general organismal agent modeling involving tensegrity networks, differentiation trees, and embodied hypernetworks. And those, if you go into the paper, it describes what those tools are, providing a means to identify the context of various symmetry breaking events in developmental time. Theirs is a ritually detailed framework that integrates a diversity of concepts, including modularity, homeostasis, this 4E approach, and more. So it kind of goes, yeah, so the paper itself, I won't get into the papers, but I think that's a good um, you know, set up to the special issue. So if you want to download the special issue, there are open articles and closed articles. There's also the, um, uh, if you want uh, copies of them, like I said, you may be able to find the preprints online or I'll put the paper in the, in the Slack and we can, you can read it over. So, uh, yeah. So the, the only thing, the only complaint I had about the, length was that, you know, we're developing these ideas and we have like a certain number of words. Word count was limiting <laughs> as I found that, you know, working on some of these ideas from the group and transferring it to a paper where it, I think the word count was like 8,000 words. An 8,000 word limit is, is not much when you're doing all this descriptive work, and, you know, trying to set things up. But, you know, it's, I think it, it came out pretty well. So, so Vrishali had to, oh, Amanda, can you go ahead? I was just going to joke that it sounds like you need to write a book. Well, yeah, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times that's what you do. You, you write a small paper and then you get the ideas worked out and then you write a book. Okay. Oh, I had a question about morphogenetic fields. Yeah. Um, does... That concept imply this morphogenetic resonance, like Sheldrake concept, um, which sounds much more esoteric. Yeah. Uh, I guess I just want to learn more about like um, morphogenetic fields um, and like the, the metaphysics of it, because I am kind of familiar with Sheldrake's stuff, and it sounds really out there. <laughs> so I'm wondering yeah. what parts of that are like actually integrated into like um like Levin's framework and then what parts might be left behind. Well I think Levin's done a lot of work with um <clears throat> with flatworms. And so flatworms have this <coughs> unique ability because all their cells are totipotent, meaning that all cells can be you know re recapitulate the entire organism. So if you took the flatworm and he broke it up into its constituent cells each cell could uh, grow a new flatworm and so if you take that model system and you think okay how does that happen that you have a single cell and then it expands into a whole organism it has to have that information encoded in the cell which may be true except that there's no real evidence that it does plus you don't really have the spatial cues that you need so, you know, he draws back on this idea of morphogenetic fields, which is where you have this or coordinate system of uh, signals. Uh, it could be like bioelectric signals. It could be chemical signals that specify what the organism should look like. And then um, once that is established, then the cells do their, fulfill their roles and take their place. 
And um, so there has to be two things happening. One, you know, you have this, um, you know, this, this global coordinating signal. And two, you have these local cells doing their thing within that. So morphogenetic fields was originally proposed as a means to say, you know, this is, uh, you know, ta-da, we have a whole organism from parts. So, you know, how do you coordinate pattern formation? Uh, people have come up with models like reaction diffusion, which is a local process that can have like a global coordinating set of signals, but it, that's still fuzzy and how that might work. So morphogenetic fields has existed. I don't know what the, I'm not really that familiar with Sheldrake's work on it, but um, it's not been like strongly supported. It, it's been pretty controversial throughout its history. I think when Mike Levin uses it, it's more like along the lines of um, that idea of, okay, uh, along the lines of organizing things at the global scale. I know that in DivaWorm, uh, we've done some work uh, with uh, Morphozoic, which is a, a software package. And this was something that we worked on several years ago. And we have a concept of morphogenetic fields in there where uh, you have a cellular automata grid and there's like a global signal that or, you know that, that evaluates large scale pattern formation. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah. But I mean, again, you know, you have to be careful with, how you're kind of um, talking about the concept, whether you kind of make it sort of vitalistic or whether it's more like a global global coordination of local interactions. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, some people have strong opinions about it. I don't necessarily have strong opinions about it. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with Sheldrake. I'll have to read about it. Uh, at least I think, he, I think wasn't he the first person I, I feel like it was kind of his idea more more oh maybe field. yeah I mean I, I haven't read the like into the the work itself I know of the concept but I'm not sure yeah some of it sounds really um I, I don't know just like really out there so I was yeah wondering, yeah <laughs> um what what developments have been made that like like ground some of these ideas um, and like get the more conventionally scientific explanation of what's going on. Yeah, that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's um, yeah. This is this like so? I like the idea of symmetry as a concept because you know we we think of like development and how it sort of unfolds, and one of the things you see again and again in development is this idea of symmetry. So you have bilateral symmetry and radial symmetry and other types of symmetry where you have things that are copied in different parts of the body. So you have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And there's a reason why you're, they're sort of mirror symmetry uh, with, with some exceptions. And that's because it's easy to implement with your developmental, uh, in, in development. So, you know, it's coordinated as a body, right? It's, uh, there's a midline, it just goes from one side to the other, just copies the information. And then there are some differences, like your heart is on one side, your organs get shifted on one side or another. But once you establish that framework, you know, it can be easy to um, to put into place in development. And I don't mean to make that sound like it's done by an agent. It's just kind of that it's easy to self-organize. Um, so, I mean, I think that's an interesting theme from this work. And I'm not sure, like, who focuses more on symmetry and who doesn't. Uh, like I said, I think that the papers were, I think there was an earlier version of this that, um, you know. So, I, yeah, I'm very interested in digging into the special issue. And, yeah, Amanda, we, we can talk more about that later, about morphogenetic fields and all that. Um, I know Levin uses it in a certain way, and it's, I don't know what he's, how he's like, I know he's advancing the ball by tying it to the flatworm example, and they're, they're, that's not typical in biology uh, as a system, model system, but, mm -hmm. you know. Well, because I know, like, <clears throat> bioelectricity is central to what he's doing. Yeah. 
so yeah i'd love to to get into that more yeah there's like this coordinating aspect where you can have chemical signals do this too where they diffuse over a long range and then you can you know cells will respond to that and so they'll align themselves in different ways so you can have like a a chemical gradient that transforms cells into certain types in a certain area and then you can have boundaries you can have uh other gradients that are interacting with one another so i mean these are in bioelectric signals i guess work in a similar way so but yeah it's uh you know there's a sort of an aspect of mysticism to some of this because like when they were doing embryology in like the 19th century, they had like, you know, there there were a lot of pre-scientific concepts around. And they <laughs> would observe things under a microscope and try to interpret them. And so, yeah, it's <laughs> it's been like, you know, catching up with rigor, I guess. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> yeah, so this page from uh, Sheldrake uh, on morphic resonance says... Uh, it's not just genes, it's not epigenetic. Much of it depends on morphic resonance from previous members of the species. Each individual inherits a collective memory from past members of the species and also contributes to the collective memory affecting other members of the species in the future. So it's supposed to be this relationship between members of the species and in virtue of them being members of the same species that is like this force that seems to exist outside of space and time yeah. um so yeah definitely seems a little um more more mystic than scientific yeah. but well, then um yeah versions of this have been are like in Levin's work so I'm curious about like the the history of the concept I guess yeah so there's this also this issue of evo devo which is like evolution of development where you have like uh, you know heredity of uh, developmental information, or you have development unfold as a aspect of like evolution. So you know developmental trajectories will change in, in closely related species. So you can do a lot of times in Evo Devo they'll do papers where they show like different organism closely related organisms, and they'll show like that there's a change in development. And so it's usually some developmental gene that gets mutated, and then there's like an environmental change that, cask, you know, that that drives this either selection for the trait, or sometimes there's an epigenetic change that can, uh, you know, make this, uh, you know, different. You you observe a difference, and like the the problem with a lot of evo devo is it's not really predictive; it just kind of as a demonstration of some of these things, like. You know, oftentimes it's just kind of like, oh, they're different species and there's this difference in development. So, you know, that's, I mean, which is interesting, but it's not uh, necessarily predictive at a higher level. Like, you know, what it, what is, uh, you know, what it, like if you look at the tree of life, you know, what are the trends in development? Are there any trends? Maybe, maybe not. We don't, I mean, you know, with Hox genes, we can predict that. We can say that Hox genes are conserved in certain lineages and they do these things and they're conserved meaning they don't change there's an invariance across where hox genes are in in the tree of life so you know that's and we know because it's very important that they're probably selected for uh intensely so i mean you can make statements like that um and there's this whole issue of heredity which of course you have to take into account which a lot of people kind of shy away from and Evo Devo. They don't like to talk explicitly about heredity and like the mechanisms of like population genetics and that. But I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot more here that like we can talk about. But <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. Thanks. That was a great conversation. It was a great conversation. And again, it's. We can come back to this. I actually want to make some promotional materials for the paper. So the paper itself, I may, you know, we may work on a presentation that kind of describes it in more detail. I think that's a good way to do that. Okay, finally we get to Vershali's update. I'm sorry, I know she had to leave, but uh, so uh, hi, 
In the past week, I made it some progress on Unity and Blender. I attended data science, Python, stats, math, etc. classes in my university and tried to understand GitHub and its functions. That's all. Well, thank you, uh, Rashali. Yeah, it sounds like you're really engaged in, in this stuff. So I, again, like I said, we're, uh, you know, we get closer to the time when we do GSOC. Uh, I'd like to give some tutorials on GitHub or at least make them available. Uh, I did some tutorials on GitHub in my project management class. We'll probably go over that again because I'm going to be teaching project management class again this summer uh, as a, a little bit shortened version maybe, but it'll still have the main components. Uh, I think it's always good to have GitHub skills, and so we'll be working on that. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's great. Um, speaking of project management, I want to give a quick overview of that. So let me share my screen again. I'll talk about this week's uh, project management topics. So I'll try to go over it pretty quickly. Let me go back. All right, so we're in unit five, which is project lifecycle and sustainability. Uh, we talked about this week, um, where are we in the time? Uh, I think 21 and 22 for this week, right? So this week we talked about automation and we talked about some wide uh, topics, but automation is the main thing. So automation is a means to save human work by machines or automated processes. And one example is the flyball governor, which is an early example of mechanical automation. You can save work by implementing some automation, you know, usually like humans, you know, ever since, uh, Early, you know, like in the Bronze Age or whatever, we had simple machines that did work like sliding blocks up an incline or something, uh, or using pack animals to uh, do things, you know, move loads. But those are all forms of automation. This is automation where you have a, a thing that spins and does some repetitive work. It involves a feedback mechanism, which is actually something I was stressing in the class in this unit because. Automation is not only a cost savings in terms of effort, but also it has feedbacks, which can be crucial if you don't understand that. And it has feedbacks to your organization. In the case of the flyball governor, there are feedbacks to uh, the process. So it's just important to keep in mind. There's this idea of the paradox of automation, which is says that the more efficient the automated system, the more critical human involvement becomes. So what happen, tends to happen in automation is you take humans out of the loop. You do something with a machine and humans are no longer, you know, touching the process directly. But at the same time, they have to be in the loop more and more. And the example I gave in class was of a nuclear power plant, where nuclear power plants are controlled by massive amounts of automation, or actually airplane cockpits as well, where you have all these dials and knobs there's a lot of automation in flying a plane. In smaller planes, you can fly it by a stick. In larger planes, there's a lot more like automation of processes. Uh, but you still have to pay attention. You still can't just ignore everything and let the automation take over. You actually have to be hyper vigilant. And so there's a lot of uh, effort and money that's been spent in the last 50 or 60 years on optimizing those kind of controls in focusing human attention to certain things. And so this is uh, Lysane Bainbridge who did this paper called The Ironies of Automation where she talks about this paradox. So it's important to remember there are a number of pros and cons of automation. So if you're in incorporating automation in your organization, you you know there are pros of, of automation. So it improves quality control. It replaces monotonous work. There's a cost savings in the long term. There's the ability to control things in a sophisticated manner. You can increase predictability and streamline processes. But there are also cons, and those include, you know, that it can be intrusive. It can encourage micromanaging. It does tend to take humans out of the loop, even when they need to be in the loop. There's an initial cost of adoption. So it can save you costs in the long term, 
but there are also costs of adopting automation, especially if you have to if there's a steep learning curve. Um, sometimes automation is hard to control at some failure point. So if the, like in a nuclear power plant, uh, if you have a meltdown, can you control that process with the existing automation? Sometimes it gets in the way. Uh, sometimes your team integration is not always seamless. The more automation you have, sometimes the returns are diminishing. So if you add one piece of automation, it's good. If you have massive amounts of automation, it's actually less beneficial. And then it's costly when your automation goes awry. So when something happens like uh, a catastrophe, like if there's a plane crash, sometimes in there's a there are very famous stories of like plane crashes that have occurred because the automation, like in telling the pilots what the altitude of the plane was, was wrongly calibrated, and so they crashed. And so that's what can happen when you over rely on automation. So this is you know kind of a discussion about like how to implement automation and things like that the other example i gave was this project cybersyn so this is like if you're interested in cybernetics this is great because it's a good example of automation of very big systems and so one of the things about project cybersyn is they were trying to manage an entire industrial scale economy and it was chile in 1972 they had industry they had agriculture uh, and they had they wanted to manage it all efficiently, and so they had all this information coming in about the market and about the you know supplies of things, and they were trying to integrate this information. So there's a data there's a data flow issue here, but there's also a cognitive issue, and that is you'd have these displays that were sort of set up, you know, in front of people, and they had to synthesize information from them. They'd sit around in a circle with these control panels on their chairs. It kind of looks like the bridge of the Star Trek, uh, the USS Enterprise from Star Trek, and so you know they're they're controlling the the screens, they're looking at them, they're synthesizing information. It's an operations room plus simulation, so they're simulating the data coming in, they're aggregating the data, but they're also making decisions and operating on the data. And the operations room itself was based on the Gestalt principle which allows users to absorb information in a simple, comprehensive manner. So like the control room of a nuclear power plant or the cockpit of an airplane, they have the, these displays that are very important to synthesizing the information and making decisions. And so um, this actually calls back to something that I featured in Unit 3, which was stream feed integration, where you have all these social media feeds that you can extract information out of. This allows maybe for serendipitous themes to emerge, which is great, but you know, you have to remember that it's very complex, it's a complex system. So, you know, maybe misleading. Um, this is based on Stafford Beer's viable systems model. So this is an example of Stafford Beer's model. It's very complex. It has it goes from individuals to the environment, it goes to different projecting out to potential futures. Uh, then we have models of this uh, where we have management structures, we have the external environment, we have all these different factors. So it's a very complex system. There are a lot of interacting parts. And this actually, there's a project on GitHub called the Project Cybersyn Train Network that's tried to like take those principles and use them for other types of little simulations. So you can still revisit this. Um, now, there's a cost to this sort of large-scale automation, and that's this book, Seeing Like a State. This is something they bring up in this book. And the idea is, is that large-scale plan projects often fail. So in large simulated systems, sometimes you have too much of complexity to be accounted for. And so this comes in the form of what they call wicked problems, but it's also just a matter of like trying to operate on so much information that's interconnected. You can operate, uh, the idea of a lot of these projects is to operate large socio-technical systems based on legibility. So that means that you're standardizing things or you're optimizing things and you're making them readable to, every, to the, the system operator. And this book, they argue that that's a delusional thing, that you can't do that. Uh, it doesn't really work in practice. 
Um, and the, the bottom line is that computers or systems like Stafford Year's viable systems model enable management of large systems, but this often comes at a cost. And sometimes, you know, something like this can be built and you can have a smooth running system, but it relies on, say, surveillance of individuals or, you know, things that are maybe socially unacceptable to people. So there's actually a strong uh, ethics uh, aspect to this as well as this idea of unpredictability and unpredictable systems. So we talked, actually, we got into some readings on project management. So in the spirit of automation, what I did was I looked this up. I used Bing plus ChatGPT, and it generated a summary of what was going on because I couldn't find any source materials on this. But I thought it would be neat to try to do this using ChatGPT. And I generated, I had to uh, trim this in the interests of legibility and, and making sense. But uh, basically, it summarizes this area. Project management automation is the use of technology and software to do tasks that humans would normally do. It helps us to complete tasks faster, with lower error rates, and with more transparency. It improves communication and collaboration among team members and stakeholders. And it's triggered by events on based on specific rules. So you can use if then rules to you know make implement your autom automation in different areas of the organization. Um, examples of project management automation, sending emails, monitoring resources, and updating status reports. So this is a very simple, like not the project cybersyn version, but just the very practical version. And so it gave me a number of resources, uh, you know, things like how AI will transform project management. And the, the main point of this article is to say that by 2030, a lot of the field as we know it will change. A lot of things in project management will become like automated. Um, there's a low level of maturities of these technologies, but soon this will improve and these will become more mature and you'll be able to use them more broadly. Um, and so then there's this uh, all about project management automation. It can create and identify opportunities for efficiency gains. Um, you know, it can help people work to their strengths. It can, uh, you know, do things like act as an early warning monitor, alerting project managers when a work stream is going off timeline or over budget. And in this article is interesting. They talked about optimization of existing operating models versus predictive modeling and experimentation. And so their argument is that in predict, using predictive modeling and experimentation, something like what we see with Project Cybersyn, it actually is better than just simply optimizing things. So simulating potential outcomes, experimenting with new uh, workflows, those are better than trying to just simply optimize an existing model. Um, what else? Okay, so this just is more, this is just kind of going through these articles um, and it's basically the same message. So I want to go to the next lecture, which is the follow-up to this, uh, where it was automation two. So we kind of went through the end of automation, but the point I want to make from this is that what we think of as automation now was actually not always automation in the past. So we can use a couple, two examples here. One is the automobile. So the automobile itself is automation of horse-drawn vehicles. So we used to use horse-drawn vehicles. We had this idea of horsepower, which was the generation of force or, or work. And so we automated that into different types of engines. And so, but we still kept the horsepower name. So uh, automobiles are automation in and of themselves. Then we had things like manual transmissions, which then became automatic. And information technology was automated a lot of the operation processes. So what's interesting here is that you have automation built on top of automation. And when you have that kind of system, it can be very hard to, you know, figure out sort of, it becomes very complex, first of all. But to also figure out how to uh, sort of implement your automation uh, optimally because you have these different layers of automation built on top of one another. Another example is word processors where you have the gradual automation of physical aspects of writing and editing. So years ago, uh, before the 1970s, 
people would write articles, edit them by hand, retype them up. It was a lot of work. And if you have a word processor now, today, it's very easy to just, you know, type something up or even speak into your computer and your computer can put it in place for you. You can edit it, you know, real time. You can even collaborate with people. And it's very, very seamless. So that's all automation. And so, you know, before the 1970s, this was very hard. And then in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, you start to get these developments where you started streamlining the workflow for typists. So originally the automation was for typists. And then you get automation of the whole editing cycle with word processor software. And so now you have automation built on top of automation. So again, it's not just a one-step thing, it's multi-step. And there's a lot of complexity. Uh, we went through an example of automation and DevOps, and this just talks about teams and how you can use this to develop teams. We talked about building accessible software. So, you know, there's a role for open source and developing accessible software, meaning it's accessible to anyone. They should be able to contribute and get what they need out of the software. There are a number of principles. Um, that involve open source software and accessibility. And then we talked about mass customization, where you're customizing products for different niche markets. And we talked about some of the ways to do that. So then we just recap unit five, which I won't get into uh, for reasons of time. But um, yeah. So any questions about that? Okay, uh, Morgan, you have an up I know we haven't, yeah, I haven't given you space for an update today. Are you interested in uh, giving an update or you can type it in the chat if you want. Uh, well, if you're if you want to give an update, you can do it in the chat. Um, and Jesse is at our Nickwick conference, so he's uh, working hard here, uh, make things happen. Uh, again, the videos for that are on YouTube. We're, we'll be getting more of the videos up. I know there are a couple that aren't up there right now, but um, and then we'll be doing an update on the paper that was just published. So, uh, I, I would like to produce a some sort of presentation on that and put it up on YouTube as well. Um, so, yeah, I know Jesse's not here and I know he asked for this, but it'll be in the recording. I didn't point him to it. But I'm going to give a small uh, review of OSF, which is Open Source Framework. Basically, how you might use it for putting up publications or preprints. So, you know, preprints have a long and varied history. Um, and basically, it's the idea that you can publish something in a way that we publish journals, but it doesn't have to be as paywalled and as regimented as a journal article. So typically, a journal article, you would send it off, you'd type it up, going way back, you'd type it up, you'd put it in the mail, you'd send it. The, the editor would get it, they'd make copies, they'd send it off to reviewers. Reviewers would return it. They'd have it marked up, and you'd have to like address the changes, and then this would go on for a while. And oftentimes, the timeline would be very long, like two, two or three years. In some fields, that's implausible. Computer science, for example, uh, computer science did a little bit differently with conference proceedings. So they would have a conference publications that were more responsive to time. Um, but that's probably in the past now, too, since we don't really have those constraints anymore. So we use a lot of, today we have preprints, which are basically where you have an article, you post it, there's a, like a screening process, and then it's available for everyone to comment on. 
And we talked about the eLife model a couple weeks ago where eLife is running this experiment where you, you know, submit a paper to eLife, you get it posted as a as a preprint. Then there's an open comment period where people comment on it, the reviews are open to everyone to see. And then you can either address those comments and get it published, or you can choose not to and just leave it there. And it's and this is something that I think they've done with um uh, F1000 as well. Uh, years ago, they would have, the, I think they have the, actually a similar model where you publish a paper, you, you put it up as a preprint, it gets reviewed by people, uh, you know, making comments. They might read the paper and may want to comment on it, and then the author can address the comments. And then eventually it gets published, whatever that means. So the uh, staff at eLife, they have this shirt that this t-shirt that some of the people on the editorial board have it says journals aren't real so <laughs> just to know where we are with that um so i'm going to go through this open source framework this is a framework for publishing projects project materials and even preprints so open source framework is an as a sort of a non-profit organization um and they run this uh, for anyone can sign up. So I think it started with in, I think it's a psychology heavy focus, but people have used this for different things. So this is my OSF uh, project area. So I actually have a lot of projects on here. Uh, if I go to my profile, I was at my dashboard. So my profile, I have a lot of projects. I have like 24 projects, 23 public projects. And I don't know what these activity points really mean, but I have a public profile and I've been around since 2016. So I've been doing this since basically the beginning of this. Um, and this is osf.io. So if you're interested in um, setting up your own account, I, I know probably Morgan knows this, but I don't know about Amanda. So let me put this in the chat. All right, so this is OSF. So what you can do is you can have public projects, you know, public components. This is a component of the uh, uh, a project that I've been involved with by eLife, uh, where there's a it's a private project, but there are these workshop materials that uh, people can use for uh, different topics, and they can, you know, modify them as they see fit. And and this all the materials are hosted here. Uh, the public projects are usually things that are more forward-facing, so it's like things that we want to put out, uh, talks, uh, papers, preprints, or even papers that have been published. So uh, let's see, we have our trajectories in cognitive science uh, session that we did in 2021. So we did a discussion group at COGSI, at the COGSI conference. It was um, Avery and myself and Jesse we did trajectories in cognitive science, um, and this is a, a quirk of uh, <clears throat> of Chrome on OSF, but it cuts off the title sometimes, so that's fine. It's just if you use Firefox, you look at this. Um, actually, Anusha Sharma is also involved in this. I forgot. Yeah, so she's been involved in the critical periods work and, and some of this work as well. So. Uh, this was something that we did and we had a session, it was recorded, we gave a number of talks. And so we wanted to, to compile all the, the materials for this. So we basically set up this repository. What you can do is you can set it up, you, you start, you go through a process of setting it up, you can add components here, which are like, you know, you can put in uh, GitHub repositories, you can link to videos. We don't have the YouTube video up here, I should add it in. Uh, after the meeting. You can put tags so you can discover it. But we would give this link to someone who's interested in the workshop and they have all the materials here. So these are all the talks, the bibliography, which actually doesn't have anything in it for some reason, the development in cognitive science and neurodiversity, which uh, doesn't have anything in it. But, um, you know, we have these things archived. So we can do one of two things. One is we can have people cite it. We can issue a DOI, which is a, a digital identifier. We can uh, have it as a 
we can license it and give it a, a Creative Commons license. We can use it as a repository so people can go back and get these materials and read them and share them. Um, or we can update these materials. We can version them. So there's a version control in OSF that is uh, quite useful for people who are collaborating. So you can collaborate in the same space. You can you know uh, share documents and version control those documents. Or you can have this as a repository where you can just view the things and share them with other people and have a record, historical record of what would happen. Um, and so there are other things here. Uh, let's see if I can go to my, um, well, I'm in my profile here. So I can go to my projects, which actually shows us a little bit differently. All my projects and components. This might take a while to get to. Um, okay, here we go. So this shows every project that I I have in the system here. So I have a lot of things here that have been put up. There's you know, like data sets and papers and presentations and workshops and all this. And so you can, it's very flexible. You can use this to publish. You can put a DOI on it. So that means that it has like a citable component. So if I cited like trajectories in cognitive science, it would be the authors, trajectories in cognitive science, 2021. This would be the DOI would be on OSF, and that would be a cite citable uh, artifact. And then it would just lead to this place where you have all these things here. So that's uh, how you use like the OSF uh, repositories. And it's different than uh, GitHub because you don't have this uh, archaic uh, way of doing like pull requests. It, uh, GitHub is optimized for code. It's optimized for making collective code contributions. This is optimized more for like storage or being a repository, but also something you can do uh, version control with, with documents usually. So you can add, like I said, you can add GitHub as a component. So the components here, you add a title, a storage location, and you, I guess you can add in yeah, you can add in like analyses, communication, data, hypotheses, methods and measures. One important point here is that, you know, we oftentimes just hand people a PDF of the paper and leave it at that. But papers are so much more than that. You can have, you know, data analysis. You can have things that you didn't put into the paper, like hypotheses. You can have data sets. You can have, you know, previous versions personal communications, you can have details about the measurements, about the tools that you used, the procedures. So there are all sorts of things you can put in here that don't really fit into the paper per se. So that's that's why another advantage of this, you can put, make these components and publish that alongside the actual finished PDF. So, you know, the paper is only a part of the whole workflow and all of the stuff that you do to produce a paper. This will help you like kind of bring that to life, make it transparent. Okay, another part of this is that you can link to OSF, you can publish preprints. So like I said, you can make this repository, you can give it a DOI, but you can't necessarily assign a DOI to a particular paper unless you make a project with just one paper, but that's kind of wasteful. Another way to do this, a more conventional way, is to do uh, to publish a preprint based on your topic area. And so this is uh, the Sci Archive. So uh, OSF actually runs a number of preprint servers under the OSF framework. So this is OSF, the repository. This is Sci Archive, the preprint server. And these things are linked. So this, if I publish something as a preprint on Sci Archive, I can actually have it show up as an OSF in an OSF project. I can link it to an OSF project. I can build on it. So it doesn't, I don't know if you can see it here, but there are um, different, uh, you can, you, it's easy to integrate your preprint with your OSF repository. And so SciArchive is this one preprint repository of many. There's actually uh, AgriArchive, Agri BiohackArchive, uh, you know, regional ones like Afro Archive uh, for Africa, 
uh, you know, Earth Archive, Eco Evo Archive, and so forth. And it's just like any air, you know, geographic area or any interest area that you want to use. Uh, you can put Meta Archive for Meta 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 Science. So there are all sorts of different archives. So the idea is to make different topical archives. Now I've pulled up Sci Archive. I've published in Sci Archive a number of preprints. Um, and these are just like the preprint list here. Uh, so there are all these different preprints here. Let's pick one that is um, perhaps a good example of, oh, this is an embodied cognitive morphogenesis right here. So let's open that up. Um, so this is, sometimes this is this pending message comes up, but this is always available. So it has a viewership statistics, download statistics, they don't really offer a, a robust comment section here, but you can, you know, there are ways, if you, if you use BioArchive, for example, uh, they have a robust integrated comment section. Uh, Archive is a little behind on that, but in any case, it doesn't matter because the point is, is to make this available to people. So this is, uh, again, making a new version of this is, is uh, trivial. You just edit it and add a new version. So you'll have different versions. You'll issue a DOI for the stub, but there are different versions that you can have. And then, you know, it makes it available to people. Um, and that's, you know, that's it. And then you can link it to your uh, OSF repository. You can add it as a component. And so that's that's good. That's uh, actually, I was thinking of BioArchive. There are ways you can uh, integrate BioArchive into all this as well. If you uh, publish a paper on eWife, I think they do interface with BioArchive a lot in their work. So that's that's the tutorial on OSF. You know, Jesse isn't here to see it, but I think it's a good place. To, like he was asking, like, well, would I publish this preprint? My answer would be you could publish it as uh, yeah, on one of the archives. You could actually also publish it in a place called Figshare. Which is a place where we can um, has the same principle in terms of issuing a DOI, having different versions available, having metadata attached to it. But it's you know it's not you know there's a very low bar to sort of scrutiny to you know publishing things, but still it's a it's a permanent location. Um, yeah. Or we create our own journal. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Put whatever we want in there. Well, I had mentioned overlay journals, and I didn't do a tutorial. I guess you could actually implement an overlay journal using OSF. If you wanted to create, like, a project and have, like, it, it be a journal, you know, you wouldn't have all the bells and whistles of, like, a journal issue, but you could have you could have a web page that serves as a skin and then use that as the back end. So it would be, like, you basically surf up the materials that way. It would take a little bit of work, but <laughs> they do have overlay journal templates too, so it's not like you're starting from scratch on that. <clears throat> Any other comments? I think, yeah, I think that could definitely be a useful tool once we have, like, once we have manuscripts that are ready to be too preference for cognition teachers. I think that uh, OSF could be a good tool. Yeah, I think so. I'm just making some notes here. All right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so that's, that's OSF and that's the concept of open publishing. So I I talked about eLife's publishing model. I talked today a little bit about green open access and then this OSF. So I'm going to continue to sort of surreptitiously feed people information about uh, academic publishing. So uh, be prepared for another demo soon on something else. It actually, there are a lot of tools out there and it's, you know, publishing is like this open access publishing moved really fast. And so, you know, it's really liberating a lot of 
areas of traditional publishing, especially like, you know, with, with some of the problems recently with getting reviewers on board. So I don't know if people are aware, but like in like since COVID, I think it's been very hard to find reviewers for papers. As editors, it's been like you'd send them out and, and you'd get like very little response. Because people, you know, don't really want to do it. They don't have time. Um, and, you know, you don't get paid. So it's really hard as a volunteer to really care or be invested in a review. So this kind of solves that problem to some extent. Although you do get the issue of like, you know, people trolling you or spamming you with, you know, bad reviews. Uh, if you know if you've ever used Reddit or something like that. But, um, you know, it, it's it's a workable system. So I will, uh, yeah, I'll probably come up with some more topics soon. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the like, commentary process is really important. Like, if, because, um, like, when something's published in a journal, there's, yeah, there's this review process. Um, there's, like, a filter. Uh, and there are pros and cons to that. So there are pros and cons to just being able to have everything as a as a preprint. So I think part of why our like annotated bibliography project for cognition teachers is um, why I think that's a good idea is you want like context for papers, you want some kind of, I don't know, some kind of review that's like tailored to what you're interested in, that it, it's not just like a, a a bar you have to jump over. It's not just like, oh, like a, a reviewer could like just not like this. One of the three, I don't know how many reviewers there normally is for a paper, but one of the few, like if they don't like it, that's that's the end. Um, but at the same time, like having some kind of commentary on the, on the paper is important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's that's a thing too, is that it's, it depends on the journal sometimes. So some journals are editor driven. So the editor basically says, this is going to happen. I want to get some reviews to know like what decision to make, but I, I'll be the arbiter of it. Others, you have reviewers, but sometimes reviewers are, you don't give the same answer. So, you know, it's like finding consensus in the reviews can be tough. And it's qualitative because it's just like a, an impression, right? Like they try to make it, standardized by saying with check boxes but um it's very much a you still have that subjective aspect to it if you're in a certain field especially with interdisciplinary work because you have people come from one field versus another field and they're very different views on things um so yeah it is very it is very hard um i may you know try to i know there's been some work on um Review processes. I, I might try to find some information about that. We might go over that in the meeting in the future. Okay. Uh, any uh, Morgan? Are you? Do you have anything to say? Or I'll give you an opportunity. No, just um, yeah. I've also been going through the the. 11 papers and um, um, yeah, there's, there's so much to go through, but um, all really, really good stuff. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, so um, yeah, we let's see. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to go into some other materials that I have here. Let's see. Where are we? Talked about that. Okay, so I'm going to get into this paper here, or this this sort of thread, bidirectionality and causality. <coughs> so this starts from. Um, okay, I remember where this was. This was in the Slack. This was Morgan uh, yesterday, I think. Posted this, and I think we've talked about this before, where. Uh, there's this issue in network neuroscience. It's maybe an Achilles heel, depending on your point of view. Uh, and this was something, uh, my discussion on ways by which analysis in network neuroscience can often go wrong and by ways of which we can help place these analyses on a more rigorous foundation. 
circular and unified analysis of network neuroscience. And so this is the basic uh, criticism of network neuroscience that it's because you have a lot of, you know, you're dealing with connections uh, between, you know, massive numbers of correlations, maybe that there isn't this um, rigor of causality or there isn't this rigor of sort of going from one place to another and establishing mechanisms, um, which is a good uh, criticism. Uh, so this is the original sort of tweet of this paper. Uh, this just shows some of these figures, uh, but I have the paper here pulled up. So this is the paper, uh, Mikhail Rubinov, Circular and Unified Analysis in Network Neuroscience. Um, and the abstract is uh, the quote here, you do not know anything until you know uh, why you know it. So that's uh, from a novel, Alexander McCall Smith. So that's an interesting starting point. Uh, the abstract reads, genuinely new discovery transcends existing knowledge. Despite this, many analyses in neuroscience neglect to test new theoretical models against known biological facts. Um, so in neuroscience, we're often interested in the data and analyzing the data and getting it to a point where we can make, you know, sort of connections with the data and the mechanisms that maybe we find through other, you know, through other types of experiments. So if we do like, a, you know, an fMRI experiment, we have, you know, ideas from cognitive psychology. Sometimes we have neurobiology and we want to like make all that consistent. New theoretical models typically aren't um, tested in terms of facts. We do generate a lot of theoretical models, but they're somewhat disconnected from that. Uh, some of these analyses use circular reasoning to prevent existing knowledge or to present existing knowledge as new discovery. So I guess the circular is gonna get into the circular reasoning here. Here I illustrate the nature of the pro this problem in network neuroscience. I describe that this problem can confound key results. I estimate that the problem has affected roughly 3,000 studies over the last decade. I seek to counter the problem by spotlighting some of its enablers and by describing unified framework for testing new models against a strong rival model. I conclude by proposing ways to prevent the problem in future studies. It sounds like there's a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> A little bit of an agenda here, but okay. Um, so he kinds of talks about, um, you know, sort of causality and how network neuroscience is sort of not really interested in causality, at least in terms of the, the way it's presented. So, um, you know, there's always this stuff about replication and, and about you know things like that, which actually people have criticized fMRI for the same things. Like, there's been a, a literature on fMRI being you know uh, riddled with uh, replication problems and with you know methodological problems and things like that. But um, that's 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 a different set of criticisms. Uh, I don't know if you've. Uh, we I think we've talked about where they'll they'll put like a dead fish or something in the scanner and they'll be able to get information like fMRI data that's uh you know I mean shouldn't you know it's interesting but it's also just kind of artifact so um a study by Jonas and Cording explicitly made the point that he's talking about the study used a computer chip as a toy model of the brain this is the uh can a neuroscientist understand a uh, computer processor paper. It repli uh, replicably analyzed ideal data on the anatomy and activity of this chip, and it showed that the gamut of popular models in neuroscience cannot explain how this chip really works. The study thus implied that the problem of the model trueness will dominate neuroscience once the data quality and analysis replicability markedly improve. So uh, this idea is that if you hold data quality and analysis replicability is uh, constant, you get this problem of model trueness, and that's really gonna be the problem of that time. I don't know if that will ever come true, but uh, the problem of trueness can manifest in analyses that test new models against weak null models. Some of these analyses use circular reasoning to restate but not to transcend existing knowledge. 
This problem can be hard to explicate in the fields of limited ability to test new models against rival models. By contrast, this problem has been apparent in fields of adequate ability to do so. Here I consider the nature and prevalence of this problem in network neuroscience, a field that benefits from considerable basic existing knowledge and that is well-defined model testing frameworks. I discuss that this problem is common and pressing in the network neuroscience literature. So he's saying that like this problem extends beyond network neuroscience, but that network neuroscience is going to be the uh, object of this criticism. So I seek to counter this problem in three main ways. First, they call attention to speculative evidence that enables circular analyses. Uh, so circular analysis will be like where you can't really get a causal chain. It kind of comes back. Like, why does something happen and it happens because it happens? That sort of thing. Uh, second, I describe a framework for testing new models against strong rival models constrained by known brain function, structure, development, and evolution. I show how this framework can unify knowledge and reduce redundant explanations. Third, I propose a way to prevent this problem in future studies. So circular analysis, uh, this, consider, this article considers analysis that uses circular reasoning to present existing knowledge as new discovery. Uh, such analyses lead mo to model over-specification, speculative results, and a problem of trueness. Uh, by contrast, previous articles have considered analyses that use circular reasoning to find structure and noise. Such analyses lead to model overfitting, imprecise results, and corres corresponding problem of re replicability. So in Table 2, he talks about two types of circular analysis. Uh, he talks about the focus of previous work and the focus of present work. He talks about these different you know, premise, problem, circular analysis, and double dipping. So in focus of previous work, focus of previous work in terms of premise, you have support for a new model that rests on demonstration of good fit to data. So this is where your data is, uh, you know, the model is fitting the data, which validates the model. The focus on present work is support for a new model rests on rejection of a null model. So this is where you basically your new model is different from a null model, and that's really the way that you can tell it's good. And so one of the problems with that is the null model itself can be, um, you know, not representative of like randomness. I mean, you know, oftentimes in network neuroscience, we'll take a null model and assume that that's either random activity or default activity. And then you'll have like this, uh, this uh, new model that is like a network model, it's different from the null model. And so if it's significantly different, then that means that you have this network. But it actually could mean that it's just different from the null model. We don't really know why it is. Uh, the problem uh, in previous work, in model overfitting, new model includes features that fit noise and data, fit to noise and data. So you have a new model that actually fits to noise instead of the signal in the data set. That's model overfitting. Model over specification, which is focused on present work, which is where the new model includes features redundant with existing knowledge. So we, you know, we have a, a network model, and we're trying to find something above and beyond what we're uh, hypothesizing for other types of uh, models, and we're including those things in the new model. I, I really don't know if this criticism is, you know, I think some of these criticisms are splitting hairs. I mean, it, you know, you could use a network model to explain cognition, you know, you're going to say, have problems with, you know, interpreting things as noise or uh, overlapping with existing models. That's not really a huge problem. I mean, it's, it's going to be a problem, but it doesn't invalidate the whole enterprise. Then we have circular analysis. So in focus on previous work, a new model is trained and tested on related data. This can preordain the demonstration of a good fit. So your model is a, has a good fit because it's been trained on data. And you, know, you can see that that just kind of reinforces itself. If you don't train, like, you know, if you train it on data, that's then you're sort of, it's like the training and testing set problem. 
So you're kind of double dipping in your training set and your testing set. So if you have like a very limited number of data sets, for example, and you run your model on the data sets basically that you've trained it on, it can do a good job on those. But then if you give it a, a different type of system, it, it may fail. So again, this is a problem. This is for previous work. For present work, the new model is tested against a null model that excludes existing knowledge. This can preordain the rejection of a null model. So this is where the null model is, is based on like a block model or something where if you don't uh, have any knowledge of the underlying process. And so, of course, a null model will be rejected if it's not really based on reality. Um, the double dipping aspect, using the same aspect of the data twice, first to train the model and second to test the model. It's what we just talked about with training and testing set uh, conflation. And then explanation of the same aspect of the data twice. First is existing knowledge and second is new discovery. So this is, uh, this kind of gets into some of these issues with, you know, they may have applied to, to network neuroscience. Uh, so yeah, this is example of circularity here. Uh, so network neuroscience is a branch of systems neuroscience that broadly studies big brain networks. So these are like the, taking the entire brain and treating as a network. Uh, it could be like voxels in a fMRI set of fMRI images. It could be recording sites in an EEG uh, array, or they could be uh, functional regions. I mean, there are different ways you can set this up. But usually it's explaining the entire brain during some activities like cognition, some type of cognition. Such networks often represent whole brain connectivity diagrams or connectomes or coactivity maps. Nodes in these networks denote neurons of brain regions while links denote synapses into regional connections or coactivities. So these models seek to explain principles of brain network structure and function. They also seek to explain changes of the structure and function across evolution, development, cognition, aging, and disease. And so, uh, you know, these are many models in network neuroscience do not rest on mechanistic evidence and then this way resemble other speculative models in systems neuroscience. So they're, they're really kind of, he's focused on this mechanistic evidence aspect. So instead of like explaining the mechanism in terms of causality, you're actually just saying what's related to what. And so that's, I think the main uh, criticism here, just phrased in different words. Um, nonetheless, modeling in network neuroscience is one important strength. This modeling allows us to test new models against benchmark models relatively easily. So in this case, we have an example uh, where we have an empirical diagram, which is something you extract from the data. You draw it up as a network with bidirectional connections and unidirectional connections. And then you encode this into uh, some sort of matrix where you capture these interactions uh, by using whatever criterion you want. So sometimes You'll use, um, you know, correlation matrices. Sometimes you'll use coactivation matrices, which are, uh, you know, covariance matrices. And then you, you know, you, you work with those matrices and it, you can build a map of how these interactions, how the strength of these interactions and how they, uh, you know, whether sometimes if they're, you know, it has a low, uh, if you use a threshold to like filter out noise. So sometimes some of these, Connections are just based purely on noise. Other times there's a signal, and so you want to be able to filter out noise from signal. You build the, the uh, matrix, and then you analyze it at this new result. You can compare this with newer benchmark results, uh, where sometimes you can just take the samples from a benchmark model uh, distribution. You can use the model data, and you can produce a benchmark result, and then compare that with a new model. So the, the null hypothesis is usually some sort of benchmark. I mentioned default activity. Of course, that's fraught with a lot of problems. You could use a random matrix, which is maybe also fraught with a lot of problems because you're just, it's, it's random activity. So if it's not random activity here, it would, you know, it would reject the null hypothesis. But we don't really know anything about the brain if we have, you know, just uh, non-random activity. 
So it, it's relatively easy to test these and benchmark them and get a result, but then you know interpreting that is going to be a little more difficult. So uh, he mentioned some of these things like early studies found that brain networks have a small world organization. Small world organization denotes a simultaneous presence of many network triangles, triplets of fully connected nodes, and in many network shortcuts, links between different network parts. Studies have proposed that this organization allows the brain to optimally balance the competing demands of functional segregation and integration. So, you know, uh, a small world network is where it's a very short path from one end of the network to the other. Sometimes this is based on what we call hubs, which are highly connected nodes, and some, you know, that allows us to pass through parts of the network relatively easily and get to the other side quickly. This has a consequence for functional segregation. So some areas of the brain are segregated from other areas of the brain, but some are also integrated. So you might use, say, like um, the corpus callosum, you know, to get from one side of the brain to the other, or you might use a functional center that's highly connected to other parts of the brain to get from two different functional areas. So that's, you know, that's how these brain networks, this is the first, you know, when people started to try to hypothesize that brain networks are organized, the first step was in recognizing the small world organization. And this is a hallmark of network science way back from the 90s when in 98, um, they published a paper on small world networks. And, you know, everyone found small world networks after that. So it's a little bit kind of like, um, oh, yeah, they said that there should be small world networks in this network. Let's see if my network has them. Oh, yes, it does. Okay, great. That's an organizing principle. So, you know, it's maybe something that we recognize as a, as a thing in networks, as a type of organization. So we, we, we sniff that type of organization out. It still doesn't explain why they're there but it's it's a it's a mode of organization so uh second later studies have found that brain networks have cores and clubs and cores and clubs are are ways of kind of describing these densely connected groups of hubs studies have proposed that brain cores and clubs from the backbone of functional integration or they form the backbone of functional integration so uh an example of clubs is the rich club in c elegans connecting which means that there are a small number of neurons that are highly connected. So you can identify like maybe I think 10 or 12 neurons that have a great number of connections across the connectome. And they're very important for coordinating activity in the, in the, in the network. So the core is a very similar concept, but um, these are important network nodes. These uh, cores and clubs form the backbone of functional integration it may underpin the global workspace or what people describe as the theoretical substrate of consciousness. I won't go there, but I will say that like, uh, you know, uh, rich clubs really are like, you know, describing the small world organization more in the context of what's going on in the brain. Third, more recent studies found that brain networks have high control nodes. High control nodes in dynamical systems mediate switches of system states. So this is where you can switch from one state to another functionally. And even like with, you can see this in the network activity, but you can also see this in the output behavior. Studies have proposed that these nodes may support internal cognitive control and may also serve as levers for external brain control. Uh, so none of these rest on mechanistic evidence. Instead, they primarily rest on two other forms of evidence. First, they rest on theoretical arguments, which I mentioned. The small world network is something they found more generally in networks. It's assumed to be uh, this sort of universal signal or signature in networks, but we don't really know that. We know that like you see this again and again in different types of networks, but we can't say for sure whether you know like brains are different than you know electric uh, electrical networks or transportation networks or whatever. So, you know, we, we find these are universal signatures, but it's very hard to know, like, it's very hard to link them to mechanisms in the brain. So, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know if that's really a good, um, you know, I mean, 
you have to accept universality, right? You have to accept that that exists. And then when you accept that exists, then you can go and find those mechanisms in the particular system. But I can see the problem, right? You can see that, like, if you're fitting a model to a universality model or universality class to a particular problem, it's really a problem in search of a, or it's a solution in search of a particular problem. So you're kind of fitting it into, like, the data that you have. And so it may or may not be a good fit. Um, so that's the theoretical argument. Second, they rest on rejections of strongman models. So in other words, when you make these, uh, when you create these benchmarks, sometimes they're straw men in the sense that like a random model or a default model. They may not represent any sort of real functional difference other than that they're not ordered, you know, they're, they're assumed to be sort of these random things. So it's, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, the relative weakness of such evidence makes these discoveries necessarily speculative. So, I mean, that's one way to view it. I, I tend to be, uh, uh, I tend to be in favor of uh, these types of models, you know, these types of universality classes. I think they have a lot of uh, power, explanatory power. But um, so, yeah. So this is, yeah, this kind of where figure three, he talks about some of these new models, benchmark models, and straw man models, and how this works. So this is a nice paper. I don't want to get into it too much more. Um, the other thing I want to talk about today real quick is this bi-directional feedback thing. Uh, this is uh, Jewish, who's a category theorist. Uh, he says, I propose that feedback is the 1960s cybernetics is bidirectionality is to 2020 cybernetics, a basically simple mathematical idea that motivates an interdisciplinary effort. So we're talking about the bidirectionality uh, in brain networks, and then now we're talking about this in 2020 cybernetics. And there's this connection between 1960s cybernetics and feedback with this bidirectionality. And so bidirectionality is really where you have these uh, things that are uh, so there's this paper here, an example of it, in brain uh, in uh, brain networks, bidirectionally connected cores in a mouse connectome towards extracting the brain subnetworks essential for consciousness. And they talk about bidirectional cores, so things are connected not only in one direction, but another direction. And so one of the criticisms I think that was made of the brain networks is that, you know, there are these models that are not maybe suited for the brain, they're not suited for, um, you know, the sort of mechanistic uh, discovery or this mechanistic interpretation. But uh, there's also this issue of um, bidirectionality that isn't really addressed well. And maybe it's something that we need to address in network neuroscience more. Maybe it's something that we need to, like, kind of res uh, resolve with brain data and with connectome data. So any questions about that or? Do you know how bi-directionality is like, it can be quantified in network neuroscience? Like, do you know how you calculate it? Um, what, what measures are used? Yeah, I mean, a very simple example is when you have those matrices, um, you know, you'll have like two halves of the matrix. So if I go to, I'll draw this out. So we have a matrix here this it's not sharing oh it's not okay yeah it's not let me share my screen again all right so if i go to this example here in this network this is my diagonal and then these cells here are symmetrical with respect to the so this is like you know uh two one this is one two Mm -hmm. And these are symmetrical uh, cells. This, these will have the information in it. So you'll have bidirectionality. This is going from one to two. This is going from two to one. Let's draw these neurons out. You can see this. So this is a bidirectional relationship. Now, if you're going from one to two, 
we sometimes assume that this is symmetrical so that there's the same strength of activation back and forth. Sometimes this activation is different. So this is like 0.6, this is like 0.2. So we have from one to two, it's like 0.6. This is 0.2. And so there you have this asymmetry. And you know we so we can measure it like this, where there like two has an influence on one, one has an influence on two. And in fact, in the brain, you see this a lot where you have reciprocal connections, but they're not like symmetrical because you know there's like this is connect there's like some signal being sent to this area and there's some feedback. So it is related to feedback. But we usually measure bidirectionality in this way using matrices where we can like calculate out the diagonals and the diagonals are either the same or different. If they're different, then there's this asymmetry in the in the in the matrix and it represents feedback or this bidirectional asymmetry. So, you know, that's that's one way to measure it is to look at it like that, to map it out. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know, maybe it's it's hard to distinguish from feedback, but I think it's there's a, a mechanism, a richness mechanism there. In other words, like feedback is we know, like if I give you a signal and you send one back, that there's some like, formula we can use to calculate it. So like there's linear feedback, there's nonlinear feedback. We know that like if there's something like dampening, it's nonlinear feedback. So there's a signal going forward and then it's there's a signal coming back that dampens it. So if there's variation, it like lessens the variation. So it's maybe some mathematical transform that gets applied and it's, you know, then it dampens that signal from going forward. And that's that's the way that's done in, in feedback. In bidirectionality, we really don't have that. We have like the information from A to B and B to A. Um, underlying that is probably some feedback mechanism. But also we have this bidirectional aspect where there's this asymmetry and you know there's there's this this functional interaction there that happens and we're capturing that. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, this is at least asking about calculating. Um, uh, this sounds a lot like the, the kind of generative modeling that we do um, with, say, dynamic causal models or neural yeah. mass models and um, kind of estimating excitatory inhibitory balances at, at each node or, you know, also bringing in the graph data and the... Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name exactly, but it's Carniodacus. Um, the the biophysics informed neural nets um, video that uh, that I put in computational psychiatry. Okay, uh, uh, is uh, yeah again like related to that, but also trying to bring in um, bring in more of the the graph data as well. Um, but at at its heart, it's still trying to do that kind of, um, well, just the, the excitatory inhibitory is kind of the simplest where it's like the feedback that you're talking about, the bi-directional feedback. Yeah. And, uh, um, so, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see this. I didn't see this uh, video, actually. Or I probably did, but I didn't notice it. It, it, it was nice. It was nice. I mean, you know, this is, um, I think, deep O-net, like operator neural nets is... Um, what he's what he's best known for, um, but this particular uh, this particular talk that he gave, uh, he's like yeah, m bringing the problem to more um, biomedical data and uh, acknowledging that in some cases you've got very little data. Um, uh, what was he mean by that? You're looking at something very complex, and you you've only got you know uh, a partial view of it, and um, it's a uh, it's a nice talk. It's a nice talk about like what what's the benefit of adding the physics into the um, into your uh, op optimization? Yeah, and then he's got a paper from like a year ago. It's kind of related to the the multimodal um, graph neural net paper, uh, recent one. But uh, I think what does he call it? Pigeon um, physics informed graph neural nets, and that that's what he's really kind of relying on in this in this talk. Um, 
that again is like a, a really interesting way of estimating um, these kind of unknown sources. Oh yeah. Uh, for 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 neuroscience networks, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's an area that isn't we even talk about is that there is this unknown component of variation. So like in a, a linear model, you can like basically take that out or you can control for confounds and things like that. Or, you know, you can explain certain amounts of variance. Network neuroscience are not a familiar with a method for like dealing with unexplained variance. I mean, because you'll have like uh, variance components. I guess there are ways like using PCA and such. I mean, you can use the PCA components to build the network. Um, so that would be, you know, somewhat solve that problem, but not entirely. Uh, but yeah, that's a good, I think that's an interesting observation. So there's a lot here that uh, we, you know, I think these are good criticisms. I think the field, though, you can see that they're kind of moving from like these very broad strokes of universality to like grounding it in the neuroscience data more and more over time. Like, you know, early, you can make uh, criticisms of early fMRI in the same way, that they were just making lists of parts of the brain that light up. But in recent years, people have worked more towards like building out things that are more uh, explicit to the data with respect to the data. Um, yeah, this is, this is great. I, I'll have to look at that video and uh, but yeah, I think this is a good, interesting relationship here. Uh, area. You were going to say something, Morgan? Just yeah, the the the, the eleven, um, especially the Darwin's agential materials, you know, really um, tries to expand our our view. Um, with this, you know, the, the, with development, right? Yeah, and yeah. and that that makes that makes the problem um, much more difficult. Uh, uh, what do I want to say here? Um, well, he, he's got a nice, um, he's got some nice figures in the agential paper that um, that relate to you know if the if the connectome is changing. Um, uh, you know, your your modeling is going to need to reflect that, yeah, and yeah. Um, and that you have you know lots of stages uh, um, uh, of development that work in, in his his um, example that kind of work like autoencoders, <clears throat> and so that the, the, the um, this complexity is being compressed. But into a kind of into a, a latent space that is is you know um, that is like a tensorial latent space, and that that needs to be accounted for for the kind of appropriate modeling. I think. It's, yeah. 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 Uh, um, it, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, yeah. So I mean, like that's one of the criticisms of what they call uh, fitness landscapes. Where they try to calculate yeah. fitness for like a set of organisms and a species, and they say, okay, you explore this landscape of different fitnesses, and you try to go to the peak because that's where the, the high fitness is. So you, you end up on these peaks versus valleys. But one of the problems is is that it's always changing. The topology of that landscape is always changing because fitness is always changing, genotypes are always changing, the environment's always changing. And so, you know, that's the way they think of that. Now, I think in connectomes, it's another a similar problem where you have these connectomes that are always changing their connectivity, not just their wiring through plasticity, but through activity. So you can build a, a, a connectome from like the anatomy, but you also, in a lot of network neuroscience, you're building it from activity. So the activity yeah. is just like fluctuating a lot more than like the, the anatomy. And so... Yeah, it's it's a really hard problem because it's moment by moment. If you get one of these situations where you're recording, um, like you know, naturalistic activity, and you're saying, "What does the connectome look like?" Well, it's a hard problem because at any one second or any point that you measure it, it's going to look different. Yeah.
Yeah, it's 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 his paper again. The the agential materials, you know, is really getting at how the um, well the the nonlinear behavior of just the anatomy, and um, you know, once you start considering things like development. Um, and too often in neuroscience network uh, uh, analysis, where we're of course looking at snapshots, you know, we're not trying to to deal with the kind of dynamic nature of the anatomy itself. But. Well, that's great. Yeah. So I mean, I think lots to think about on that front. Um, you know, we've talked in cognition futures about like what dynamical systems and like how like the brain has these naturalistic, like we measure the brain using fMRI or something like that. And in an experiment, it's usually a very fixed controlled environment. So we get a snapshot of behavior in a, in a you know, we can repeat the, the sort of exposure to the stimulus and then we do like a we kind of clear our minds and we start over and that I mean that has a lot of problems with like trying to figure out whether there's carryover or we assume there isn't but like with the naturalistic paradigm we start with this premise that we're just going to let people behave and then record their behavior in their brains and then there's a lot of like stuff going on with the dynamics there that really had the maybe recavoc on a connectome so I mean you know we talk in cognition features about dynamical systems from the standpoint of like trajectories but you know it's worth thinking about like what do these connectomes look like and not just like as a summary state but like as like a just a general aspect of like you know and especially when we talk about the stuff that Fuchs talks about with uh, the brain being a resonating organ and uh, interacting mm. with the environment and so forth yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's interesting too. I mean, it's uh, I'm trying to trying to think about why the Levin paper is so so tough to to um, you know fully take in. Or again, I'm talking about the Darwin's agential materials, but you know, it's like he's he's talking about you know these these structures, not necessarily neuronal, but but you know, how is evolution learning? Uh, um, you know, over over much longer periods of time, <laughs> um, and able to you know incorporate what it's learning into um, you know genomics or um, into the yeah what does he call it the morphogenetic space <laughs> yeah or, or you know tra traversing the morphogenetic space. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, th I think maybe. Yeah, a lot of a lot of his work is focused on a kind of different time scale, but it's still is treating evolution like a learning process, right. and that's that's maybe the connection with Richard Watson's work, and um, uh, it, it's been interesting to see that um, uh, you know he he goes on a lot of people's podcasts as a guest, but the kind of podcast that he's been running himself has been focused on you know these these topics of. Uh, evolutionary theory and um, how it plays a role in in understanding, you know, agential material. That's been been interesting. And he's had, he's, you know, this past month he's had Richard Watson as one of the guests um, on this this kind of discussion podcast. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I know what that is. Yeah, Amanda, mm. is is that what he's been putting on his YouTube channel? Just these talks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just like, I mean, it's it's more like a discussion, mm -hmm. you know, it's just um, the three of them. So Ian McGilchrist um, uh, himself and and um, Richard Watson at, at Southampton. And um, and I think before that, I think he did the same thing, but with um, Chris Fields, who's both a... Uh, um, you know, collaborates both with with Levin as well as with um, Carl Tristan. Yeah, really, really interesting. You know, 
high high level discussions of of um, yeah uh, evolutionary theory and um, and and how it relates to you know ec ecology and um, uh, development. Sweet, yeah, I haven't checked those out yet, but I want to. Yeah, yeah, they're they're they're, they're tough. They you know because these. They're, they they this, uh, are all you know experts in their in their areas and um, in their multidisciplinary areas. So, right. uh, it, it, yeah, it's like really slow going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to you know work through. I mean, again, his his agential uh, materials paper is you know it's a 20, 25 page paper with three hundred references. <clears throat> So more generally, yeah, I mean, people have tried to make this connection between evolution and learning because, you know, like learning, you think about it as like this process within an organism. In evolution, you have this transmission of information between uh, generations or between organisms. So like, you know, people focused on cultural evolution, but also like, you know, the implications for biological evolution. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a, interesting area because like in approaching it from like say like a genetic algorithms point of view i mean it's sort of continuous yeah. like but like yeah. from a biological point of view it isn't necessarily continuous so it's yeah. like you have to sort of get your mind into like all these different kind of systems and mechanisms so like development is similar but different from evolution and learning is similar but different mm -hmm. from development and so yeah. how does that all fit together <laughs> Yeah, 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 and the 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 discussion devolves into philosophy very quickly, <laughs> in, in a good way. In a good yeah, way. yeah, in a good way. Yes. And Amanda's like, no, it doesn't devolve into philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> from from the kind of detailed engineering uh, um, discussions that we might uh, um, get caught up with in. In, you know, data analysis and things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, I think that's it for today. Um, hopefully, this was a very good session. I, I think it's a very good session. And uh, mm. yeah, hopefully, we can, you know, follow up on some of this. I know there's a lot that we threw up the wall today. So <laughs> yeah, I tried um, to take good notes in the Notion page. Okay. You did go to the Notion. Yeah. Jesse put the Notion in Slack. So I'm glad that you got that link. Thank you for that. That's very good. And then, yeah, Jesse, you'll, Jesse, of course, will be back next week, and, and we'll be back as well. So, yeah, if we have any comments, uh, we should bring them up. We should definitely follow up on some of those. I'll try to facilitate that next week by kind of revisiting some of these topics uh, that we talked about, especially at the end. I think that's useful. Um, but otherwise, I think, uh, yeah, I'll post everything in Slack. So make it easy for us to reference. Sounds good. I'll try to watch. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, we have a recording so you can go through, you can crawl through it and say, oh yeah, that's that point. <laughs> well, it, it, and the, um, the very first reference, um, I mean, it's really helpful to go through um, uh, Dennis Noble's work. Okay. And, um, um, so this is the, Physiologist who's been trying to, you know, one one of the things that um, that I can um, post in Slack is the uh, debate between Noble and Dawkins, yeah. talking about um, like Darwin's Darwin's own understanding of evolution, yeah. <clears throat> and trying to, you know, what what um, Noble kind of has or focused his the his legacy on was. Was trying to um, trying to uh, show people how Darwin's views of evolution, especially at late in life, uh, had um, focused on physiology and function, and how important that is to consider, and how it changes your view of of evolution and and also of. Um, uh, well, how how quickly how quickly things can evolve if there are um, uh, other processes other than just random mutations. Right. 
Yeah. Say again? I said like back to Lamarck. Yes, you know, yeah, you know, exactly. Let's get yeah, exactly. Longer as they reach. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and and so he he's you know Noble is the one that um, that uh, Levin's kind of leaning on in terms of, of this um, this idea, a kind of uh, a, a loosening of of evolutionary interpretation yeah. that that incorporates functionality and and physiology, and um, and it helps explain a number of. Uh, uh, experiments that that don't fit well with with that you know random mutation drives everything um uh, what what some people will call um the modern synthesis or you know no, noble will call the modern synthesis yeah. so there's some some great videos of that i mean it's being and just again being really important for this discussion of how evolution and learning are related yeah there's also um, the extended synthesis work which uh you yes. know is you, you can yeah. find that on the internet, I guess. Um, yeah, and I think Noble Noble's group is like something like you know, their the third way of evolution or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Amanda. Um, I don't think I have anything to add. Okay. I'm trying to take notes. This has been very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, have okay. a good week. You too. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.